Welcome back. All right, so this is a topic for a video I've been wanting to do for a while, but I wanted to wait because there has certainly been a lot of dunking on Patterson having a rough time of it in the second half of the season from fans, from media, and, and everywhere, right? And I wanted to wait. I, I wanted to just, you know, see that things settle down a bit online and make a video of my own on the topic because I'm a Patterson fan. I'm wearing a Patterson jersey just to be fully transparent on this issue. <clears throat> and I think Pedersen is going to bounce back next season. I do, and we'll go through it. So in his career, he's been very consistent at home and away from home. At home, 202 games played, 84 goals, 128 assists, 212 points. Away from home, 205 games, 86 goals, 114 assists for 200 points. So his points per game better at home than away from home, but not dramatically different. And a pretty consistent effort from Pedersen every night. Now, I understand that people have this, this opinion of him based on how the season ended, but how quickly they forget. So, 2018-2019, again, at home and away, his numbers are very consistent. 35 games at home, 11 goals, 21 assists, 32 points. Away from home, 36 games, 17 goals, 17 assists, 34 points. I think the fact that Patterson recorded more goals on the road than at home tells you he's pretty good on the road. Now, before the All-Star break, 40 games, 23 goals, 22 assists, 45 points. And then he hits the rookie wall, which happens. Rookies have a harder time in the second half of the season, traditionally. Four, 31 games, 5 goals, 16 assists, 21 points. So the numbers for Patterson drop off in the second half of the season, but Canuck fans rightfully excited about what's coming. So 2019-2020. Uh, 35 games at home, 15 goals, 21 assists, 36 points. And away from home, 33 games, 12 goals, 18 assists, 30 points. Now, of course, that's at the time of the pause, right? Now, <clears throat> before the All-Star game, 49 games, 21 goals, 30 assists, 51 points. And he did slow down after the All-Star break. 19 games, 6 goals, 9 assists, 15 points. So we hit the pause in the middle of March, and it goes until August. In the playoffs in 2020... 17 games, 7 goals, 11 assists, 18 points. And so he's above a point per game in the playoffs. He was the number one scorer for the Canucks in those playoffs. And I, th I thought he played really, really well. Now, he does end up playing injured in 2020-2021. And you see a dramatic in influence on his numbers there. 13 games at home, 6 goals, 5 assists, 11 points away from home. Uh, 13 games, 4 goals, 6 assists, 10 points. And of course, there's no All-Star game that year. <clears throat> so for Pedersen, it's a frustrating season. Uh, he's dealing with a wrist injury, and that bothers him. And we get into the 2021-2022 season at home. Uh, 39 games, 17 goals, 21 assists, 38 points. Away from home, 41 games, 15 goals, 15 assists, 30 points. So better at home than away in 2021-2022. Uh, Pre-All-Star, 46 games, 11 goals, 13 assists, 24 points. So... The first time the naysayers came out for Pedersen was during this time period. Now, people who knew Pedersen and people who watched Pedersen could tell he wasn't 100%. And it was his wrist. He was fighting through the wrist injury. Uh, he had a much better second half. So after the All-Star break, 34 games, 21 goals, 23 assists, 44 points. So he reverses the trend there. He's much better after the All-Star break. Plays really, really well to finish out the season. 2022 2023, 39 games at home, 18 goals, 31 assists, 49 points. He's better on the road. 41 games, 21 goals, 32 assists, 53 points. Before the All Star game, 47 games, 21 goals, 37 assists, 58 points. After the All Star game, 33 games, 18 goals, 26 assists, 44 points. So he's very good before the All Star game. He's very good after the All Star game. There you go. He's 11 points above games played before the All-Star game, 11 points above games played after the All-Star game. In fact, <clears throat> considering it's 33 games after the All-Star and 47 games before the All-Star, he was better after the All-Star break. So, and we'll get into the contract talks and 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 that soon here. But 2023-2024, the first half of the season, uh, at or no, it, at home, we'll get to that part. I'm getting ahead of myself, I think, here. So just, and go. 41 games at home, 17 goals, 29 assists, 46 points. Away from home, 41 games, 17 goals, 26 assists for 43 points. So before the All-Star game, 49 games, 27 goals, 37 assists, 64 points. Fantastic numbers, right? After the All-Star game, 33 games, 7 goals, 18 assists, 25 points. 
Those numbers are awful, right? And then in the playoffs, 13 games, one goal, five assists, six points. He was not effective in the playoffs. So these numbers here are the ones that everybody has just jumped upon and decided that this shows that Pedersen's overrated and it ignores every other number on the board. It ignores how he played before the All-Star break because that doesn't matter because after the All-Star break, he wasn't very good. So we'll focus on that and the playoffs. And we'll get into the why, but I want to get into the contract part of things first because, again, Pedersen's just... I, I think the Canucks... Miss their opportunity here. So his initial cap hits 925000 until 2020, 2021. So that's your three-year entry-level deal. And they get a bargain with Pedersen there. And then he signs an extension that's only for three years at $7.35 million per season. And what threw people off was he said he wanted a chance to win. And Canuck fans, as only Canuck fans seem to do, they take that personally. I've never understood that. I've never understood why when a player um, is is playing out their contract, and they're like, well, I, I want to sign with a chance to win. And fans are like, do you hear that? He wants a chance to win. He wants that way. He wants to get off the Canucks. You're, you're just telling people you don't think the Canucks, you don't have any faith in the Canucks turning things around. So when he signed the extension this year, that might have been a surprise to some of those people because when he signed the three-year extension at $7.35 million, first off, that was seen as a bargain contract. However, everybody knew darn well that by the time we reached 2023, 2024, the flat cap could be going away. And so Patterson and his agent played this well. They managed to get a contract expiry to match up with when the salary cap's going up. And for the Vancouver Canucks, uh, they're staring at a restricted free agent, Elias Patterson, who they don't want to walk to unrestricted free agency. They don't want to lose him for nothing. They don't want to lose the player at all. They feel he is a focal point of the team and will be throughout his career. <clears throat> so Pedersen wants a chance to win. He signs an eight-year extension with Vancouver, which I take to mean he feels like there's a chance for him to win in Vancouver. Otherwise, he would not have wanted a long-term extension. And he waited a long time. He waited a long time. The Canucks even considered trading him or... Or they bluffed, one or the other. Either they bluffed, they were considering a move to Carolina for him, or they were legitimately thinking, if he doesn't want to be here, that's okay, we'll move the player. Either way, he signs the extension, which has a cap hit of $11.6 million until 2031-2032. Between now and 2031-2032, I'm guessing we're going to see more guys above the $10 million mark. I'm guessing salaries are going to keep going up in the National Hockey League. They're not going to drop. And so that salary cap hit for a superstar player you feel like is your number one guy is justifiable. Now, if they had multiple guys above that $10 million, $11 million mark, we'll have something to talk about then. But they don't. They have Pedersen, and at some point in time, I think Quinn Hughes ends up with a salary cap hit that's in a similar range because he's one of the best defensemen in the National Hockey League. Now, this past season... Well, how Pedersen played had a huge effect on whether or not the Canucks won. In wins, uh, 50 of those, 29 goals, 43 assists, 72 points, and he's a plus 42. Now, they didn't lose a lot in the first half. Second half, 23 regulation losses overall by Vancouver. Two goals, eight assists, 10 points, and he was a minus 23. So the, the reality of the situation is that Pedersen is the key guy for the Vancouver Canucks. And how he goes, so do the Canucks. So, if anything, it's a minor miracle they got past Nashville in that first round where he was basically kept off the board. Uh, and then, of course, Edmonton. That series went a lot longer than I think even most Canuck fans thought it would when Shelovs was the starting goaltender for Vancouver. So, I, I think that while there's some doom and gloom around Pedersen, it's easy to forget that he disclosed he had an injured knee. He injured his knee in January. His, his coach backed him up. Uh, Talkett described it as tendonitis in his knee, and they had doctors working with him, felt he could keep going, which some fans have seen as being incorrect. Oh, that, that didn't happen. And well, why didn't they tell us? Because it's the National Hockey League. They don't tell you when somebody's hurt, especially if they're playing through the injury. They don't tell us what the injury is when the player's not going to play. So they're not going to tell us what the injury is when the player's playing because then you're encouraging other teams to, you know, slash the guy on the knee 
uh, maybe take a little bit of an extra run at that knee, because players will do that. Not the same as they would in, the, say, the 90s or early 2000s. Imagine that the fighting video players used to play. But they'll still do it. They'll still say, okay, this player is hurt. He's not injured, and oh, that's a Shorzy reference. Are you hurt or are you injured? And if you're hurt, you play, uh, which is very hockey. That's how hockey players are. I'm hurt, but can you play? Sure. So they had doctors working with him and felt he could keep going. That's why they didn't shut him down. Looking back, I wish they had shut him down at least a couple of weeks, give him a chance to rest up a little bit and get that knee in order. But the thing with tendonitis is, does that necessarily fix it? Maybe not. So the eight-year extension was signed March the 2nd. And I wanted to point out the date because his production had already started to drop off before that contract was signed. And the number one argument I've heard is he got his money, so he stopped playing well. As if that's something we see frequently in the National Hockey League, something players do all the time. It's rare. There are times where, yes, a guy will sign a big money long-term contract and their play drops off, but it's rare. Pedersen got that contract because he is the first-line center for the Vancouver Canucks, and their intention is to keep him as the first-line center of the Vancouver Canucks for the foreseeable future. Now, we can have the debate about how the Canucks are in terms of their, their contention status and what the team's going to look like next year and, and, and how many points they might put up, but I cannot stand here and say Pedersen was a major problem and he's got to go because I don't believe it. And I'm, I'm quite surprised at how many have said it. They're never going to win with Pedersen. Even though I didn't hear that conversation point back when he had 102 points in 2022-2023. I didn't hear that. Uh, I didn't hear any complaints about his game then. Uh, certainly there were complaints about his game before the All-Star break in 2021-2022 when we knew he was dealing with a, a wrist injury. The one thing we've learned with Pedersen, and this is the one concern I have with him is, multiple times now, he's played through an injury that maybe he should have taken time off to heal up. That is as close to any kind of criticism as I'm going to come to with Pedersen, because did he play well here? No. But I'm not going to look at those 46 combined games between regular season and playoffs and say, well, that invalidates a 400-game career as a Vancouver Canuck. I can't get there. So that's where I'm at with Pedersen right now. I do think $11.6 million a year. It's high for a guy who scores 25 points in 33 games, but I think for a guy who's had a 100-point season and could very well have more 100-point seasons to come, as long as the rest of the Canucks roster is signed for decent cap hits and they're not going crazy with contracts, I don't think it's crippling, and I don't think it's a huge problem. Because I've seen this, oh, the Canucks' problem is Pedersen's cap hit's too high. Uh, no, no. Uh, there, there have definitely been bad contracts on the Canucks, uh, but what we see, what we saw this summer in part, like look at Joshua's huge raise because he had a good year. There were a lot of Canucks that had really good years. Zadorov cashed in off of what was a great run with the Canucks uh, to go over to Boston to sign for I would think probably at least five hundred thousand more per season than what he would have got if he'd stayed in Calgary and played out the year there. His run with Vancouver and run in the playoffs raised Zadorov's. Uh, profile and I think it got him more money and kudos to him I have no problem with that but that's kind of how hockey works it's kind of the NHL works is that when your team's playing well and you're showcasing these players that are playing really well in your system suddenly as unrestricted free agents their money goes up they're worth a lot more than what they would have been if not showcased by your team and it's, it's a risk the Canucks run. So now Patrick Alvin has to go out and make sure that he's got all the right guys and support support roles for the Vancouver Canucks. But I don't think Pedersen's the problem. And considering this was the first time the Canucks have been in the playoffs since 2020, and only the second time they've been a playoff team since 2015, I'm pretty happy with the state of things right now. It is so much more fun to cover a team a local team that actually should be a playoff team again this year, even if I can't afford to go and watch games. I mean, and and I say that because not because I can't, like, find money to go to the games, just it's too much. Uh, it's way outside my budget. But I get it. The Vancouver Canucks, division winners, absolutely. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks, a team that has a really good core that I've been very vocal about for a long time. There's a reason I have jerseys of J.T. Miller, Quinn Hughes, Pedersen, Demko, um, Besser, 
Uh, yeah, Besser, Miller, Hughes, Demko, Patterson. It's a lot, right? And and I've had a Josh Levo jersey too. I have a Josh Levo jersey I'm staring at right now. I, I believe in this group of Canucks. And I, I don't know if they're ever going to win a Stanley Cup. But if they do, if in my lifetime I see Vancouver win a Stanley Cup, I would love to see Pedersen holding that up and then see what fans who are complaining about this portion of his 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 career would have to say then. Uh, my experience with Vancouver fans has been that if you have a bad game, well, you're a bum and you should be out of town. And when you have a really good game, they start talking about what the Stanley Cup would look like and, and how quickly the guy's going to be able to lift it. And who, who do you think they're going to hand the Stanley Cup off to? It's an interesting fan base. Uh, people people talk a lot about Leafs fans and all this, but the reality is hockey fans, sports fans in general, you're going to get that. It just feels like the negativity around Patterson over the last few months has been really quite astonishing to me because I'm not, again, I'm not saying he played particularly well, but I don't think that he's a bad player or that this, this means that from now on he's a 50-point player. And he's just going to sit with his feet up on the bench and go, oh, I got my money. So you guys better get out there and start playing better because we're losing. And it's not my problem because uh, I've got an eight-year contract. I got no movement clause. I'm not going anywhere. Like, he's not that guy. He is not a player who is just going to take time off and just, you know, goof around. Because if he was, he wouldn't have played through this injury and he wouldn't have played through this injury. He would have said, you know what? I'm not good enough to go. Um, I'm going to go rehab my knee. I'm going to go rehab my wrist. He's not that player. So again, my one criticism, I, I wish he wouldn't play through injury the way that he does. I wish he would take the time off as needed. But this again, the doctors thought he could play through it. Coach felt he could play through it. And looking back, maybe that was the error. But again, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe in the event you've not done so already. Thank you guys so much for all your support as always. I will talk to you again soon.